Okay, so I think we can get started. Thank you everyone for coming to this Archer 2 webinar. Today we have Harvey and Doug from HP giving us a talk on uh, debugging using GDB uh, for HPC and CCDB on Archer 2. Okay, so I'm Harvey Richardson. I, I work within the, the Center of Excellence for Archer 2 and Douglas works with me. We, we're both based in Edinburgh. We have an office in EPCC in the Bayes building. Uh, and what we thought we'd do today was we'd do a, a quick introduction to a, a couple of the debugger tools that are available on, on the Archer 2 system that come as part of the HPE Cray programming environment. Uh, so so th the agenda is that I'll give a little introduction. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the history of specifically two, one of these tools, which is GDB for HPC, which is the one we, one of the ones we're going to concentrate on. So we're going to concentrate on parallel debugger command line tool. And we're going to concentrate on a tool called uh, CCDB, which allows you to essentially debug two applications simultaneously. And we'll explain why you might want to want to do that. Uh, and, and hopefully this will be quite useful. And it, and it won't be you know, as, as long as the usual webinar, it might, you know, maybe 30, 35 minutes. Uh, so we'll, we'll take it quite easy. So, uh, and just to set some context, uh, there are a range of tools provided as part of the, the Cray programming environment. And, and, the, and some of those target debugging and some of those target profiling. And we're only going to talk about the two in purple here, GDB for HPC and CCDB. Although I'll briefly mention one of the other tools. So uh, in, in terms of debugging tools, there are a couple of tools that are quite easy to use. Uh, one, one's called ATP that enables you to get a stack trace of an application that's failed automatically. And one's called STAT, which has a capability to attach to an application that's hung. Uh, and I'll explain why I think ATP might not be as useful as normal in this case. But GDB for HPC actually can take over some of that functionality. So it, uh, that's the thing we want to really concentrate on. The other tool is, is a parallel version of Valgrind that I'm not going to mention anything about. And then there are a range of profiling tools as well. And I should also mention that although I'm going to talk about the tools specifically that are provided with the, within the, the Cray programming environment, uh, EPCC does have a license and other people, you know, for, for another tool, which is graphical called DDT. Uh, and, and also some people have brought other performance tools to, to the system. And they, so there are other, other things that are available as, as well. Uh, so so I, I think as to, in terms of a, a more high level introduction, one of the big challenges we have is that you know applications may have bugs the system may have bugs and, and what do we do if we need to to determine something about what's going on such that we can either fix a bug in our own code or we can uh, submit a support case and then have other people look at the problem and try to determine if it's some problem with the system software uh, so so and there are some challenges with, with that because we might not be able to reproduce something so we might have a situation that's quite rare you know an application might hang one in a hundred times uh, that's a tricky thing to deal with an application might crash very infrequently which is another problem to deal with so so being able to post more and analyze a crash is a useful thing and then the other thing is that it's, it's not as simple as the old days when we had you know, a single application that was one process and we could run a serial debugger on it. We now have tens or hundreds of thousands of processes and that gives us a challenge of scalability. So how, you know, how do we deal with that? We, we probably don't want to have 500,000 core dumps created and written to the file system. And, e and even if we thought that was a good idea, are we going to be able to analyze that in a scalable way? So, so, and this is the reason we do really need scalable tools to enable us to both analyze a crashed application or even stop an application and work out where it is. You, you probably don't want to look through 20,000 backtraces or stack traces to work out why your application might be behaving in a strange way. So, so a, a better way to deal with that is, is something that's quite useful. And, and I did mention that I'll mention one tool in passing this tool called uh, ATP, which stands for Abnormal uh, Termination Processing. So it's something you can enable. So you can load a module, which is called ATP. You can set an environment variable ATP enabled to one. And you would also, most more usefully, uh, also make sure that your limits for your process are set such that core file size is not constrained or set to zero so that you have an unlimited ability to create core files. So, if, so 
if this is enabled and you run an application, what should happen is that at the point an application crashes, ATP should spot the signal that it was created when it was crashed. And you'll see something like you see on the right-hand side. You'll see some messages that start with ATP. You'll get some information about what's gone wrong, so a segmentation violation in this case. You sh you'll get a stack trace. Uh, the difficulty at the moment is, I think, for some because there was some there was some change in LLVM, that means we're not currently seeing line numbers from this tool, and that makes it not as useful as it would otherwise be. So, so uh, that, hence I'm going to explain how to do this essentially with GDB for HPC. So, uh, on on Archer, we were able to use this tool and we got line numbers, but at the moment we're not getting line numbers. I'm hoping that gets fixed because it's quite annoying. Uh, and the other thing this tool does is it it creates a special file which is called the dot file, which you can view with a command that's provided by the system called stat view, and that enables you to see essentially a graphical view of the stack trace across a set of applications. Uh, but just to mention that tool does exist. And once it does line numbers again, I think it's going to be a useful thing. So if we think about debugging and the history of debugging, you know, U Unix had debuggers called DBX and other names. And then GNU provided uh, a debugger called GDB, which is nearly 40 years old now. And that's quite a, an impressive tool with a lot of features. Uh, so, you know, you, you can load the process and run it. You can attach to a running process. You can analyze a core dump should a process have failed. And, it, and should it have been configured to set a core dump. Uh, this is a command line tool. Uh, it, it requires that you use particular uh, compilation flags to get the most information. So typically you need to use some kind of debugging flag. And then it has a set of commands that are quite common amongst all command line tools that debugging. So it has a command to, to run uh, or restart a program, run, or, you, or, or typically these commands have shortcuts like R for run. It has a command to set a breakpoint, so you can say, okay, I'd like you to stop at line 100 in a particular file, or I'd like you to stop at a particular function. It has the ability to print variables. It has the ability to halt an application and continue an application. It has the ability to allow you to step through lines of code, or should li your lines of code include functions, you can step into functions. Uh, and, and most usefully, it has a command to create a backtrace from a given state of a program. So you can work out how did the program get to the current position of execution? And that's a crucial thing. So this tool is super useful, but it's limited to one single process. Now, you could attempt to run this for a parallel application, but you'll have fun trying to write scripts to debug a single process with this or to run lots of copies of it. So it's not really a scalable or a useful way to approach debugging a highly scalable uh, application uh, and, it, and it has a, a whole range of features that i'm not really going to go over but it, as i said it, it, it's a quite a complex tool and i'm hoping you can read the text on the right so if anyone thinks that's really really too small i'll zoom in on it so just speak up and let me know so i just want this is just showing a quick session for gdb and and this is one of the most useful capabilities of a debugger which is that you can run it on an application uh sorry you can run it and you can have it read the core dump from a failed run, right? So in this case, we've launched GDB by saying that we want it to load information from a binary VH1 MPI Cray and also load information from a core file. So it loads up and prints lots of messages. Uh, and, it, and it then tells us that the application had created a segmentation fault. And then the most useful thing we can we can do at that point is get a backtrace. So this BT command creates a backtrace, and that enables us to see where the application failed. So what we'd like is a parallel version of such a tool, and that's exactly what GDB for HPC is, and that's what I'm going to talk about next. So GDB for HPC, uh, and it's uh, and the reason I went through GDB a little bit is it supports most of the common GDB commands, so it looks a bit like GDB. Uh, it's not as simple as just saying it's a forwarder to GDB because it it has some specific syntax that enables it to deal with parallel applications. It understands how to get information from multiple GDB uh, instances that it's running. You know, it tracks its own state and and has to do its own kind of syntax checking. And it does have some escapes for GDB syntax, but I'm not going to say much about the those I'm re we're going to really go through some simple scenarios and explain you know what, what's the basics that you would need to know about this tool and what, what are the most useful things uh, so before I do that I'll just mention a bit about the architecture of the tool so GDB for HPC uh, on the is essentially running multiple copies of GDB on each 
PE or process or rank of your app, of your parallel application. So something that you've started from S run that's parallel is something that GDB for HPC should be able to debug. So it could be, you know, a Fortran MPI program or a C MPI program or a Shumem program or a Cobra Fortran program. Uh, and essentially it, <coughs> it starts up on the front end here. So a UAN or from within a batch script and then it uses a framework called mrnet so and, and a set of scripts uh, so there are a couple of components here there's a tool launcher that's used this thing called cti there's a framework called mrnet that, that is essentially a scalable framework for launching applications coordinating so coordinating a set of tools and applications and aggregating information so so one so ag aggregation is important for example if you had 50,000 stack traces you'd like to know are 49,000 of them the same and a few of them different that would be a useful thing to be able to aggregate so essentially collapse a tree of information of stack traces uh, and this actually came from i think initially from monash university in uh, australia if i remember correctly uh, so, so this is the, the basic architecture. So when you start up an application from within GDB for HPC, you're essentially building this complete infrastructure. Uh, so a lot of demons have to get set up, which takes a little bit of time. So, so the way you use GDB for HPC is that you, you load the module of the same name. So that enables you to get access to, to the uh, executable. And you need to compile your application to get most useful information from the tool you need to compile with some sort of debugging flag so either dash g or the the cray compiler has an option capital g that varies the extent of the debugging information against optimization so it's a sort of trade-off that, that you can make uh, so so once you've loaded the gdb for hpc application uh, it's a command line tool so it gives you a prompt uh, and then you can you can launch an application and there's there's a, there's a few ways to 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 launch it, either you run GDB for HPC and it starts an application for you and it will cr get Slurm to give you resources to start that application. Or as, as an example here, you can run an salloc command and then run GDB for HPC, in which case the resources you get are the ones that the salloc has, has given you. Or if you ran within a batch script, you've already got resources, but it can, it can run either way. I tend to use it interactively, so I tend to, type the command gdb for hpc get the prompt then do a launch so this is the launch command you would use so the command is launch dollar p and what this syntax is doing is it's essentially naming a set of processes and then you give it a number of processes or ranks that you want to start uh, and you and and you give it an application so a binary that you want to run and optionally, you can use dash dash args to, to supply a set of arguments that your application might need. So you can't, you can't list that after the application name. You have to specify it as dash dash args equals something in double quotes. Uh, and that's the typical scenario that I would generally use. The SLX is useful because you might want to run a sequence of um, GDB for HPC sessions. Uh, uh, so the other thing that, that quite often you would have to do is that if let's imagine to run GDB for HPC from the login node and you want to get it to launch, you know, and, and, and allocate resources. So in this case, I've said launch dollar P. So I'm naming the set of processes I get and I'll explain why we do that later. And I've said in curly brackets four. So I'm going to end up with four processes. So if it's an MPI program, it will have four ranks. Uh, and then I can supply extra arguments, which essentially go to the S run. So it, I mean, it, it depends which app, uh, workload manager you have. So this, this tool can work on PBS, but we have Slurm on Archer too. So in launcher arg, you might want to put your account information or a time limit or partitions or queues or uh, quality of service information, whatever you'd normally put on an S run to get you the resources or to define the project you're using. You know? So, and typically if you haven't already you know, if you're not running GDB for HPC within SALAC or a batch script, this is something you probably have to do. <clears throat> uh, so, so once you do that launch, that pr that previous slide I showed you, all of those processes and tools get started up, and you're in a position where you've started up a range of GDB sessions, and it'll wait for you to do something. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can attach to an existing running application. Uh, and to do that, you actually have to provide the specific Slurm step that's running. 
and, and you might not know this, but if you run a Slurm job, you, you the Slurm job has multiple phases. So if you run sstat or sact on a job ID, you'll see that that job had multiple phases, and one of them will be the step of your actual s run that you did. There'll be there'll be a few other things. So to actually attach GDB for HPC to an application that's already running, you need to find your job ID and the step ID, and you use those as arguments to the attach command. So in this example, I've done s batch of a slurm job, and then you know wait a little bit of time. Maybe that job hung, and I want to attach to it. So then I run GDB for HPC, and I do attach dollar p. Notice there's no curly brackets now because GDB for HPC can work out how many processes there are in this running application. And then I give it the job ID and I say dot and then the step ID. So that's the way to attach to something. So that's a different use mode. And then the final thing I'll just mention is that it, it does have a batch mode. So you can create a file full of GDB for HPC commands and then run it uh, and point it at that file, in which case it will execute the commands in that file and then it will exit. And I should mention, I can't see comments that are in the chat. So uh, usually Douglas who's will be watching for them. And if it's important enough, he'll, he'll uh, make Somebody it. just asked what um, the step ID is. Yeah, so it, it, it's basically when you run a slurm job, a slurm job is composed of different steps. <clears throat> so, so the initial step is to run your batch script, right? So it'll start up your batch script and that batch script has S runs in it. And each of those S runs is a different step. So if you do, S act or S stat on a, on a slurm job, what you'll see is you'll see a table and that table will say job ID dot zero or one or dot batch or dot two or dot three. So your job ID might be 156489 and the S run that you actually ran your application with might be step two. So in this case, you would say whatever that number was, I just said dot two, right, when you attach. So it's, it's a component of a slurm batch job. You don't generally need to know about that, but in this case you do. Okay, so so we've already said, you know, GDB for HTTP is essentially an overlay on, on, on GDB. Uh, and it has this concept of process sets. So I mentioned this, this dollar variable, which was, it's, it's actually defined by the launch command. Uh, so that's the way we define it. And GDB for HPC uses this dollar and curly brackets as part of its specific syntax. So, so on the right-hand side here, you can see that we've started up GDB for HPC and we got some messages. And then we did launch dollar a curly brackets eight. So that says launch an application. And the application here is a high .exe. When you launch it, name a process set A, right? So we've got this processor set called A. Uh, and when you launch it, use eight processes, you know, or eight PEs or eight ranks. So, so that's really a, a definition almost. It's defining a process set with, set with eight elements. So then you see there are various startup messages. So it's saying it's creating an MRNet communication network. It's starting up some, some demons. It's finalizing its setup. And then the launch is done. And then what you see is this another thing that GDP HPC for does is it gives you a prompt that's defining the context. So the context here is that we've got the process set A and we've got members zero to seven of it. So given that context, we've reached an initial break point of the application. So it started up our application and it stopped it at the very first point that the application runs. So, and it's telling you that it's at line uh, 81 of the source code, which is probably, I imagine it'll be one of the first lines in main. So, so, so think of GDB for HPC as having a prompt that gives you context, or it prints something that gives you context, followed by information. In this case, the information is that it's reached a breakpoint. Now, process. So, so if we continue, if you look at the right hand side, so we could continue that session, and we could use what looked like traditional GDB commands. So we could list some source code. So we've listed from line two around line two twenty. So here's some source code of our application. We can set a breakpoint. So I remember I said earlier, break is a GDB command. So we can say B223. So that so and so now GDB for HPC has given us one of these messages. It said, in the context of the processor A and the first eight elements of that, you have set a breakpoint, and that breakpoint is at line 223. Then what we can do is we can carry on. So remember I said that we launched the application and it was stopped. Now we're going, we've set a breakpoint. Now we're going to say continue. 
So the application then will, will start to execute and then the next message we get is a similar one. It's saying, okay, given the context of the PEA, sorry, of the processes at A and the first A elements, I'm now at that breakpoint. So I'm at breakpoint one, uh, which is in the routine in MT, right? So, so, it, so it's telling you where it is and it's telling you where it is both in function terms and where it is in source code terms. And then when you get there, you can print a variable. So for example, we could do PIT and again, this is an example of context because IT doesn't have the same value on every uh, PE or rank. So the first three, it has value zero, and the last, sorry, the first four, it has value zero, and the last four, it has value 255, right? So another example of context. So, um, and we can also uh, make references or de or in fact, we can declare new process sets by using this syntax uh, inside the curly brackets. So dot, dot, is something that defines a range, or we can list PEs with uh, with com with commas, right? So there's some examples here on the left-hand side of, of how we might either see references to uh, particular uh, elements in a process set, or we might define them. And and if you if you ever want to know what a process set's got in it, right? What you know, how many processes there are, then you can do view set dollar PE to see the members. So if you did that on the A that we initially set, it would say that A had uh, eight. Uh, members. So, so then the other thing we can do is that we can we can constrain the focus of what we're doing within the debugger, right? So, as I said before, if we have a large number of processes in our application, so you know tens of thousands, we probably don't want to print a backtrace on tens of thousands of processes because that if, even if lots of them are the same, it still might be a lot of information. So we can essentially focus the context and we can do this with the same syntax. So on the left hand side here, you can see we could do focus dollar PE and just choose zero, one, two, three, or we could switch back on focus on everybody again, or we could define, we could name a process set to be that collection, right? So, so at the top, when we're doing the focus, we're essentially defining a temporary context, but we can name that context. So in this case, I've named it few. So we can use def set to name the, uh, the first four to be the process uh, set few, and then we can focus on that by doing focus dollar few. Uh, and we can use these in variable references. To, so to do that, the syntax is, the process set name, or we can index that inside the curly brackets, two colons and then the variable name. And, and I'll show an example later. So if we switch to the right hand side here, so the example of the run here. So the idea here is I've, I'm running an application, which is a simple Pi example. I'm not showing you the launch here, but you can see from the context, right? So on the left hand side, it says PE 0 to 19 initial breakpoint is in main. So that gives you the clue that I started this on 20 processes. And then I listed, I did a list of line 18 to 19. So that's an L. So L18, 19. And you can see that those uh, lines had a, an inquiry for the rank and the size in MPI. So then I set a breakpoint on line 18. Uh, and then I did a continue. So, I, so at that point, execution carried on and it stopped at the breakpoint. And then I focused on just three of those, sorry, four of, of the 20 processes. Uh, so then what I did is I did next. So I jump over that, that line. Uh, and you can see, again, the response I get back is I'm being told what position the execution is now in. And then I can print rank. So rank is, is the variable that I've just set from calling MPI com rank. <clears throat> and, and you can see I only get four things here because I've previously set the focus to just be four of the processing elements. So I only see four things, right? So that's that's one way to kind of zoom in on just a few bits of information rather than uh, see all twenty of them. Uh, and, and then and then what I've done is I've, I've I've switched back to see everybody, and then I've printed rank again. And you'll notice that uh, this time all of the other ones are zero. And the reason for that is because if you notice, when I did the focus, I then did a next, and that was the thing that defined the rank. So all of the other ranks didn't do that call. So that's why that variable is zero. So, so this, this focus doesn't just affect you know, printing variables, it affects the commands that you, you can execute. 
Okay, so, so 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 then we'll have a quick. So give, given our understanding of how this tool works, what are the scenarios where it's useful, right? So so one scenario is clearly your application hangs, right? So you do S run your application. It either you see nothing or it runs for a little bit and you see some output and then you see nothing and you think, okay, that's depressing. So now we already know that we can attach to something that's running, but I'm not going to show that example. So I'm going to assume here that you just kill it or your job ran out of time and you're now going to rerun it again but from a gdb for hpc session so in this case we would launch it again so here we've done launch uh name the set of processes a use 128 processes we're going to run this application called vh1 uh, so so we get into vh1 now the behavior of gdb for hpc of course as i said before is it, it it launches your application it launches all the debug support and then it stops you at the start of the program so if you want it to hang you need to let it continue so we do a continue and then what will happen is the prompt will come back but your application will be running in the background and and you'll just sit there and nothing will happen so you then need to halt it so halt is the other useful command so it then halts the execution and you can see here it's now reporting where was each of these processes and as you can imagine, the more the more you've got, the more this is, right? And this can be quite hard to understand because if if you're in your application, it's usually not so bad. So so if you're if you were hung inside application code, uh, then this stack trace is probably going to be quite homogeneous. However, if you're in a network stack, you could be all over the place in different routines in the network stack, and that's normally where you are because no matter no matter what caused you to hang anywhere, the eventually it gets into your network communication right which stops everybody else so uh so the next step of course is you do the halt and it'll tell you the, the lowest level which routines you're in and then you do a backtrace so here i do a backtrace and you can see that everybody is at a particular location uh, so they all shared a particular part of the stack and then some of the processes were in a different place so so this is the typical thing you would do is you you want to get to this backtrace point uh, now you might be lucky, and if you if you don't use any of these tools, your application might crash. You might get a core file. You might be able to run GDB on that core file, and it might just work. You might get something useful, but you don't know which core file. You know, what, you don't know which core file it was. You don't know which process it came from. You don't necessarily know it's the one that had the initial problem, right? So uh, this is a bit, I guess, more of a scientific way to approach this. So so then. Repeating a bit of what was on the previous slide, you can see that line 40 of suite y.f90 will be the place we should look, right? Now, now, this is an example we actually use in some of the training. So we already know what the problem is. And it was it was an error with running different competing collectives and they weren't synchronized properly. Uh, so, but this is the basic approach that we could use. And then just to remind you that you can attach to something that's hung as well. The difficulty would be that you probably don't realize that until it's too late, you know, your job finishes and, uh, you run at time. And so, so then the second example is you have an application that crashes. So this is this is an example where you, you run it, it, it typically with segmentation fault. Uh, we can do the same thing, right? So we, we load in GDB for HPC, we continue from the initial breakpoint, and then we do BT and we work out where we are. And then we look at the source code and work out, you know, what possible things might have caused that segmentation fault. So that's the, the next example. Uh, and, and then finally, uh, I'll just mention that this syntax I talked about can be used uh, both in explaining the context and and for print statements. So here we we've we've got an application loaded, and you can see there's 512 uh, elements to the process set this time, and and so we list some source code. So you can see nested loop setting a variable s0. Uh, we set a breakpoint, we continue to it, and then we print s0, but we only do it on the first eight elements of a. So that was this syntax I mentioned on a previous slide. So we do print p dollar a index zero dot dot seven double colon s zero. So that's a way just to print a few things to see if they're roughly what you expect them to be. Um, and that's another way to reduce the the huge amount of output you might get. Um, and I, I've been there before when we were doing the uh, initial benchmarking of Archer two. We had one application where its initial setup phase looked like it was hanging. Uh, and essentially, so it was taking longer and longer and longer. So when you got to running on 2,000 nodes, so 2,000 nodes times 128 is a big number, right? Uh, it would take exponentially longer to, to start up. And we eventually discovered that, so what I did was I ran GDB for HPC on it, and I just ran it for a while, because I knew it was taking a long time. 
And then I did a, a halt, continue halt, looked at the backtrace, and I could work out exactly where it was. And I could see it was in the same part of the setup code. And it was just a lack of scalability in the setup code. Nobody had ever run this at, you know, at such a scale before. So you know, that's the other scenario. It's a, it's a quick way, without doing any profiling or adding any timers, to, to find a piece of a code that's taken a significant time, as long as you know roughly when that time is, right? And you can stop it. Uh, and so, uh, and there's, there is much more advanced usage of GDB for HPC, but I think we just wanted to cover the basics. And I think that we have noticed that sometimes people have a problem, they, they submit a query to the help desk, and this is the extra information often that would be super useful, because otherwise we might have to ask for a copy of the job and then run it and do some more, uh, you know, some more work. Now, if we, if we had some of this stack trace information, we might be able to tell immediately if it was a system problem we'd seen before or it was likely to be a user code thing or make some suggestions you know so so hopefully that's been useful so so before we carry on are there any questions about gdb for hpc and we'll have a chance to ask questions at the end so you've got another opportunity there are a couple of raised hands okay are people able to unmute themselves and speak um yeah Hi, I have a question. So I've tried GDB for HPC on Archer 2 before, and I have the problem that if I put the breakpoint in a part of the code, which I know only few processors are stopping there, but I know that the others are not, then when I try to print a variable, it doesn't want to print anything because there says that there are other processors that are still running. So how could I get the information? Do I have to put the breakpoint somewhere else to stop the other processes or do halt or something like that? But I think, okay, so I've not come across that particular scenario, but I'd imagine that once you get, once they hit that breakpoint, mm -hmm. you should be able to do halt and stop everybody else. Okay. Yeah, I've, so never I've not tried. tried that myself. So if you give it a go and if it doesn't work, then let, let us know and we'll try to investigate. Okay, yeah, I'll try to do the hold. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that's an answer, but if it's not, then let us know. Mm -hmm. So you said two, uh, uh, Douglas? Oh, no, sorry. It's, uh, it must be, a, that was the, the hand. I think it's three okay. people in a, in a room together. Okay, so, so I think what we'll do now is we'll, we'll, we'll move on to talking about comparative debugging and, and I'll, I'll probably keep presenting, but Douglas will talk. So you let me know when you want me to move slides, Douglas. Yeah, sure thing. I can't control this, can I? So, so you. No. So, um, all right. Okay, so we're going to move on to talking about comparative debugging. Uh, the name's somewhat self-explanatory, but we're going to discuss it kind of briefly what exactly it is. Oh, you've skipped ahead. Um, and also what um, CCDB, the create comparative um, de debugger, does. Um, and we'll walk through a simple, a simple example of how you might use CCDB to comparatively uh, debug two versions of the same application, um, but, but for which you're seeing different answers. Okay, so, so what is comparative debugging? So the key concept here is that we have two applications with the same set of data and we expect the outputs to match. Um, so we run two programs or two instances of the same program simultaneously, and we want to look for when the results diverge. Um, so, so what are the, the, the scenarios? When might comparative debugging be, uh, be useful? So I think it's kind of the, the typical like report you get from somebody, I poured my Fortran code into C or C++, and now the results are different, or the classic one that everyone has uttered at some point, I made a change to my code that wasn't supposed to change anything, but it does. So <laughs> it might be that you've ported an application to a new language, you've rewritten an algorithm for which you expect the answer to be the same. You might just have recompiled an application with a new compiler, um, a new library, you know, different scientific library, LibSci or MKL, you know, a, a different MPI. Um, you could even be using different optimization levels, or you could be running on new hardware, for example, and you want to um, comparatively debug. So, so what is 
Harry, can you go to the next slide, uh, slide please? Yeah, and I think language port could include adding OpenMP to an, an application, for example, to make it. Yes, easier. actually, that was, yeah, that was one I thought of earlier, actually. Um, so what is um, CCDB? So CCDB is a, is a, is a GUI tool for um, comparative debugging. Um, so it's relatively simple to use, and it's essentially built on top of GDB for HPC. So there, there is a, a comparative debugging capability within GDB for HPC, but it is reasonably complicated. Well, maybe that's a bit harsh, but it, it, it's more involved in setting up than it is in CCDB. So essentially CCDB provides an interface to make it much easier for users to interact with GDB for HPC and perform comparative debugging. Um, so it enables a user to run two executables side by side. Um, they can create automatic comparisons between sets of data structures, uh, create custom warning and error tolerances for comparison between variables. Um, so a user can compare an executable giving correct and incorrect results. And CCDB will help to locate where the code uh, begins to, the codes begin to deviate. Um, and then once you've reached this point, you can then investigate further with a more in-depth debugging tool like GDB for HPC or a memory debugging tool like Valgrind uh, for HPC. Um, so in, in terms of requirements, so both GDB for HPC and CCDB, so they need to know the name of the, the variables that you want to compare, their location in the code, and you know, where the comparisons have to be made. Um, and how the data is distributed over MPI processes. So essentially, they require these, these three entities. So they require a, a PE set, so the, the set of MPI processes for the variable uh, you want to compare, an MPI decomposition, so how the variable is then distributed over a, uh, the PE set, and then what's known as an assertion script. So an assertion script is essentially a um, a collection of uh, relations, so mathematical comparisons um, to be tested between the two executables. Um, so we're going to discuss this in, in, in detail later in the slides. Um, so all the above can be done, as I've mentioned, GDB for HPC, but it's much more, it, it's much simpler to do this in CCDB. It's, it, it's literally a case of point and click within this GUI tool. So Harvey, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so as I mentioned earlier in the next couple of slides, we'll walk through a very simple example, um, step by step, of using CCDB uh, on Archer 2. Uh, so the particular situation here is I have two versions of this uh, Amino benchmark. So I've the original version I've downloaded, and then a version where I fiddled around with it and produced an error on purpose uh, in order to be able to use this. Um, uh, debugging tool. So, okay, so how would we progress? So firstly, we'd load the, the Cray CCDB module uh, to access the CCDB um, executable. And I, I, we'd advise before um, launching CCDB to firstly compile your application using either, so, so using debugging flags, um, because it does require, it will set breakpoints um, in the code um, for doing its comparisons. And we also suggest um, requesting res res resources using an salloc before launching uh, CCDB. So you can pass um, batch scripts also, but generally, I mean, whenever I've used it, I, I request a, um, a resource allocation. Um, and then it's just a case of populating the GUI with the application details. So um, you can see the, the GUI here on the right hand side. So we'd um, click and find the location of where our applications are. Um, we'd set the work directory. We'd set any launcher arguments, um, the batch type if we were giving uh, CCDB a batch script uh, and the number of processing elements. You can also tick whether it's on the GPU or not. Uh, on Archer 2, I would advise that um, 
you will more than likely have to use um, the launcher argument um, oversubscribe um, to specify to Slurm that more than one job can execute simultaneously on the, the compute resource that you've specified. So once you've, anyway, once we've populated the GUI with the application details, we can then click on launch to launch um, both of our applications. So Harvey, can you go to the next slide? Okay, so I mentioned assertion scripts previously, so we're now gonna step through how you would um, generate an assertion script. Okay, so once um, both applications have launched, they'll then stop at the first breakpoint, which as Harvey mentioned, is usually the kind of one of the um, first points in the application, uh, usually the first line main. Um, from there, if we then click on this I symbol on both applications, it will take us to um, these first breakpoints in the source code. Um, to build an assertion script, we then click on a line number. So we'd left click on a line number in the source file, and it would bring up this box, and we'd click on um, build assert. So, if, Harvey, if you go to the next slide, this would op then open up the, uh, the following kind of window, but unpopulated. Uh, so, this is your assertion script, and from here, the user can now populate the assertion script with the particular comparisons um, they want to perform. Um, so here you would populate this by giving the, the line location for where you want to do this comparison. You would give the variable name. Um, PE set should be populated. Um, you have to populate decomposition, but CCDB usually will give you in the drop down menu uh, a sensible choice for this. So we're comparing scalar variables here. So it gives us these. Um, if you're comparing something for which the line numbers and the variable names are the same, you can click same to um, um, save yourself a little bit of time. You can then specify the operators to the comparison that you want to um, perform and set epsilon will let you um, essentially set the tolerances for the, um, the warning and error checks that CCDB will perform. And once you're happy with your, your um, comparison you've done, you can click on add a cert and it will add it to the list of, um, of, uh, of comparisons in the assertion script. Once you're finished with this, uh, I'd suggest clicking save script. We'll save it under the name that's specified here. I think you can modify this yourself, but it, here it's SCR0. Um, if you were to click close, you would come back out into the, um, the, the regular GUI. Uh, Harvey, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, but we can access any assertion scripts by in the original GUI, GUI clicking view and then assertion scripts and then choosing from the menu there. So if we only had one, it would um, give us the one that we just previously made. So um, now we, um, we'd want to run our assertion scripts. So we can choose to either um, stop on the first error that is um, at CCDB flags, or we can choose for it to run all the way through both applications showing all errors. Uh, so for in this example here, I've run all the way through um, allowing CCDB to show all of the warnings and errors that are in this, um, in this particular comparison I'm doing between those, these two Hamino applications. So for, from these 11 comparisons I've got in my assertion script, I have three warnings and um, two failures. So the three warnings in this case are actually because the, the variables are zero. So that's one kind of one thing to, to note here. But if I was to click on the warning um, box and it would show me that the, the difference between them was zero. Um, if I click on the fail boxes and it, I can see by how much they deviate. Um, and then as I said earlier, it's a, 
it's a case of then knowing, well, this is where a deviation starts and I can use a more in-depth debugging tool to, um, to really kind of um, hammer down on what's going on in the code. So Harvey can go to the next slide. So just a brief kind of summary of some, some kind of pros and cons of CCDB. So it's, as you've seen, it's very intuitive to, to use. It's quite a simple GUI tool. Um, from experience, it's a lot easier to set up um, than an assertion skip script um, via GDB for HPC. Um, and it, it's relatively simple, simple to get up and running quickly, to do a quick comparison and narrow down where exactly it is the differences in your code are actually occurring uh, before using a more in-depth debugger. Um, it is not as polished as some other GUIs, so some of the, the other um, um, yeah, some of the other debugging tools that are out there um, is still in very much in development with our um, our PE developers. So th there should be updates in the future. Uh, it's also not a general purpose graphical debugger, so you will have, as I mentioned, have to go to another debugging tool to do more in-depth debugging. And also something else to, um, to bear in mind, so it does require X forwarding. So depending on your connection, it can be a little slow. I find when I'm in the office in the base building over a fast connection, it's, it's, there's no lag whatsoever. But if I use it at home, there's a, there's a little bit of lag. So that's something just to bear in mind. Um, are we, so in terms of documentation, so the first two links there give links to uh, HP documentation for GDB for HPC and CCDB. Um, so there's quite a, quite a reasonable amount of information there. Uh, CCDB also has documentation inside the GUI. So if you click on help, it has quite a lot of information within there. Um, EPCC also have very good um, debugging documentation um, at the fourth link there. And as usual, um, if you load the modules, there are the manual pages as well, which will give you um, uh, more details on, on how to use these debugging tools. I think, yeah, acknowledgements also to John and Aniello who provided uh, quite a lot of information, uh, background information for these slides. So thank you to them. And yeah, any more questions for Harvey and myself? And you know where to find us if you've got questions in the future. Yeah. Can I ask, out of interest, has anybody used CCDB on Archer 2? Apart from myself. <laughs> <laughs> I was expecting silence as the answer, by the way. All right. It's, uh, I think it's not that intuitive. So making the initial step of trying it is quite high. And you need the use case, right? I mean, I think yeah. if I if I was that example, if I was adding OpenMP to a code and it was, you know, gradually going wrong somewhere, that I might look at this. But, you know, it's that's, like anything. It's quite, you need a familiarity. It's quite a good, that's quite a good example because I remember having done that myself before and having to do, well, essentially write scripts. And then do one to open terminals and then do the, do the comparison that way. There's a quite so the, the slides will be available. So if you, how are you going to make them available? Well, well, way that's going to work is the the recording will be available. I don't normally make my things available as slides in public, but if anyone wants them, you can contact me on this email address here. Just be aware I'm going to be on holiday from Friday for a while, or contact uh, training at EPCC or, 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 or you know, get in touch any, any way and we'll, we'll send you a copy of the slides. So that's mm -hmm. not a problem. So were there any more questions, Douglas? Not that I see. Okay, so, well, well thanks everyone for attending. It took a bit longer than I expected, so I hope it was useful. And, and, uh, and as we said, you, you know, get in contact if you've got any further questions or we'll be fine.